بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته الى يوم الدين ثم اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته brothers and sisters and welcome uh, this is the second lesson of our study of surah al-hadid and uh, last week we spoke about uh, some introductory points we spoke about uh, the general message of this surah the 57th chapter of surah al-hadid we also spoke about how the surah can be broken down into five sections. Thereafter, we spoke about the name of the surah, the chapter of iron, and how it relates to the overall message of the chapter. We said that the name, iron, is found inside the surah. Where Allah says, and we sat down iron, and in it is the potential to inflict much harm. And how that corresponds to the overall message of the surah, as some scholars have suggested. Now today, inshallah, we hope to cover the first three verses of this surah, where Allah begins by saying, سَبَّحَ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمِ A very brief translation. Everything in the skies and the earth glorifies Allah. And He is the Almighty, the All-Wise. The surah... Like I said last time, it's one of the musabbihat and it begins on a note of tasbih. What does the word tasbih mean? We said that it means that when you declare that Allah is flawless, Allah has no shortcomings, Allah has no deficiencies. And in the context of human beings and in particular disbelievers and idol worshippers, it has another meaning which is when a person says subhanallah, he is declaring that Allah is far removed from the silly things that people say and they do like claiming that as some of the mushrikun did in Mecca that the angels are the daughters of Allah or the Christians say that Isa السلام, Jesus Christ is the son of Allah or what people say today atheists and people uh, who are against religion they say if there was really a god why is there so much suffering in the world if there was really a god how come uh, people religious people go to war all the time and so on and so forth they make obnoxious remarks about allah so when you say subhanallah or when you read subhanallah that everything in the skies and the earth is making tasbih of allah they are declaring that allah has nothing to do with the silly things that people say and they do allah is far removed from that. Allah transcends that. Now reflecting over this verse, the scholars of Islam like Imam Tabri, they said what this actually means is that both the living and the non-living make tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does that mean? Angels from the jinn kind, from mankind, as well as everything in the sky from the sun, the moon, the stars, the galaxies and beyond and everything on this earth from trees, from grass, okay, uh, from rocks, mountains. They are saying that the meaning of this verse is that every single thing that exists, living and non-living, all make tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a very powerful meaning. It's a very powerful idea. Uh, and just to break it down for you, imagine that you went trekking. We climbed up a mountain like uh, we went trekking up Ben Nevis. Uh, we never made it to the top, uh, unfortunately, inshallah, second time round. But when you get halfway, has anyone been up Ben Nevis? You've been Ben Nevis, right? So halfway up, there's a, a lake in the side of the mountain, right? There's a lake, a, a huge lake. And I remember thinking to myself, what is a lake doing up here in the middle of the mountain? The mountain is that, is that large. And that's the halfway point. There was a cloud of mist hovering over this lake. And it's beautiful. You stand there and then just a few yards further up, there's a waterfall. And you turn around and you see the beautiful landscape and you see you know, the clouds, they're casting shade over parts of the grassland. And you see trees in their hundreds, as far as your eyes can see. And then you hear, you know, you see sheep trotting about and all of this, Imagine for a moment that when you're up there in the mountain, seeing all these things that you were given to speak headphones. Yeah, these headphones, you put them on and all of a sudden you can hear the tasbih of all of those creatures. Tell me, how would you feel? It, it, for the first time you heard it, how would you feel? 
You heard creation say, Allah, you are perfect. You are flawless. I mean, how would that affect your heart? How would that affect the way you think about Allah? It would make you grow in your estimation of Allah's greatness, true or not? Isn't it? Now, the interesting thing is that what is greater, what is a bigger creation? A mountain or a human being? What's greater? What's bigger? The mountain, right? Galaxy or a man? Galaxy, right? Even in the Quran, Allah says, uh, خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ أَكْبَرْ مِنْ خَلْقِ النَّاسِ That the creation of the sky and the earth is greater than people. وَلَكِنْ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Most people, they don't know that, they don't appreciate that. Now, if what is greater than you sings the praises of Allah, how should that make you feel? Imagine someone who you respect, okay? Let's say, uh, let's say a colleague of yours, okay, he's a scientist, he's a scientist, okay, he's a, he's a friend of yours, you, you have a lot of respect for him. He says, you know, there's this guy, he is an expert in uh, astrophysics, and he's got so much knowledge, and he's, he keeps praising him. He says he's got so much knowledge, he's so well read, his, his understanding is so deep, his papers are so amazing. Your estimation of that guy just went through the roof because your friend said so. Someone you respect, right? Now here, the same thing applies. When you hear that that which is greater than you is glorifying Allah and saying Allah is great and Allah is perfect and flawless, how should that make you feel? It should make you feel like, SubhanAllah man, seriously, I should listen to what everything else is doing and that should affect my appreciation of Allah's greatness. Yeah. In fact, there's a sense of competition. When you hear that everything is making tasbih of Allah, it should make you feel like you should compete in that. Because human beings, though they may not be as great as a galaxy, they are more valued than a galaxy, isn't it? وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ Allah said, we, we honored the children of Adam. Human beings are more valuable than mountains to Allah. True or not? So if mountains are outdoing you in singing Allah's praises, how should that make you feel? It should make you feel like, no man, I should be increasing in my tasbih of Allah. Everything out there is making tasbih of Allah. How can I not say subhanallah more? How can I not say alhamdulillah more? Yes. This verse, the implication of it, is people glorify Allah more. Understand how great He is, everything is making tasbih of Him. Linguistically speaking, the word sabbaha, I said it last time, is the past tense. Ibn Ashur, he said, what that shows is that this, is, this amrun is muqarrar. It is an established fact that everything glorifies Allah. Now the past tense has another nuance of istimrar, which is continuity. As far back in history as you go, you would find that the creation of the skies and the earth was always glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Always. Yeah. Now when you come to Surah Al-Jum'ah, Yusabbihu lillah, which is the present tense, it has another dimension, which is everything is making tasbih of Allah now, present tense, but also in the foreseeable future they will continue to. So past tense, everything back in, as far back in history as you go, and present tense, now and into the future. As far into the future as you can go. Everything is making this be, oh, oh human, what should that make you do? It should make you want to remember Allah more. Allahumma ja'alna laka dhaakireen. Oh Allah, make us from those that remember you often. Allahumma ameen. So, subhanahu lillahi ma fi samawati wal ard. Somebody may ask, you said that even long non-living entities make tasbih of Allah. How? How does the sun and the moon and the mountains make tasbih of Allah? I can't hear them. They don't have a mouth. They, how do they make tasbih of Allah? It's a good question, right? So how do we answer this? In some scholars, they said, the way a non-living thing makes tasbih, like a tree, 
or a mountain is by its very existence. By its existence, it indicates the existence of a creator. That's how it's making the sphere. However, other scholars, they criticize this. They say this is incorrect because Allah says in Surah Al-Isra, وَإِن مِّن شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِهِ وَلَكِن لَا تَفْقَهُونَ تَسْبِيحَهُمْ Allah says in Surah Al-Isra, that there isn't a single thing except that it is making tasbih of Allah. However, you don't understand its tasbih. You don't understand it. So if you try to hypothesize about how, for example, some scholars have said an atom or an electron makes the speech of Allah, you are going against the other verse which is saying you don't understand it. You can't understand it. You must just accept it and appreciate this. Yes, this is how we answer this question. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows this. al-Aziz al-Hakim. Two names of Allah wrote. The word al-Aziz, the name al-Aziz has Three meanings. It has more than this, but I'll give you three meanings. The first meaning is Al Aziz means Allah is the most powerful. The meaning of power, Quwa. This is number one. Number two is the meaning of authority. Authority. Sultani. And the third is the meaning of respect. So when you say Allah is an Aziz, it means Allah has the ultimate authority, is the most powerful, and has the most respect. Yeah. The second name, Al-Hakim, usually translates as the most wise. Al-Alusi said Al-Hakim here means that whatever Allah does, it is driven by wisdom and maslaha. Wisdom and benefit. Wisdom and benefit. You know, sometimes a person decides on a, on a course of action and he doesn't think it through enough. He doesn't weigh out the pros and the cons as he should have. And he ends up making a bad decision. You follow me? When Allah is an, when you say Allah is al-Hakim, it means whatever Allah does, not only is it wise, but the benefit always outweighs the harm. Yeah? Al-Aziz al-Hakim. Now if you Look at these two names together, you find something quite amazing. Because if we think of it from a human perspective, Al Aziz, one of the meanings is Allah has the most power, right? Power. What happens to a human being when he becomes very powerful? Hmm? He becomes corrupted, becomes arrogant, he becomes tyrannical. Yes? Usually, human beings that get great power, they become great tyrants. And to be honest, you don't have to be a king to know this. You could get a promotion at work. And all of a sudden, you know, you look down at everyone else. Your own colleague who you were working with yesterday, you know, you don't have time for him anymore. You want to be called by your title now. What happened to you, man? You're just like, easygoing guy yesterday. And then you got your promotion. And now, you know, you're a stuck-up person. You don't want to eat, you don't want to have lunch sitting on our table anymore, you want to go sit with those guys. What happened to you? Just a tiny bit of authority can corrupt people. Just like money as well. Just like money. Allah Al-Aziz Al-Hakim. That though he has the utmost power and authority, that doesn't detract from his wisdom. It doesn't make him or diminish his wisdom and want to benefit human beings. It's beautiful. Al-Aziz, Al-Hakim. What is the opposite of a wise person? Ignorant? Foolish. Foolish. Yes, that's what I had in mind as well. <coughs> the opposite of a wise person is a foolish person. Yes, a foolish person. The thing is, see, one of the ways to understand the meanings of words is to think about the opposites. Why is a foolish person a fool? Is it because he doesn't know? Or is it because he may know, but he doesn't use the knowledge in the right way? That's the reason, isn't it? And that's how you understand wisdom. There's a difference between wisdom and knowledge. Somebody may know a lot of stuff, but when they speak, they don't say the right thing. <laughs> in fact, they say the wrong thing. Yeah, there's many examples come to my mind. I'm trying to think of one that's suitable to be mentioned in a gathering like this, but you know what I'm saying? Someone has lots of knowledge. And they say some daft things, man. 
You think to yourself, what is it? Where did your knowledge go? Yeah? I remember once, uh, we did a, a youth retreat at the masjid. We got teenagers and young kids. Very difficult to get young kids to come to the masjid, to stay overnight. So much they came, they stayed overnight, prayed fajr together. We're going to go play football together, right? And then we hired our sports. Well, everyone's very excited about that. And uh, one of the uncles, you know, I respect, he said, would you like to do a reminder? Okay, would you like to do a reminder? He said, of course. Uh, so he sat down, after further, did a reminder for these. Do you know what he spoke about? He spoke about how foolish people are for liking football. And how dumb they are for supporting football teams and wasting their time playing football. He didn't know we were going to football. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, for 15 minutes, he went on and labored the point that there's no benefit in football, and then you wear the shorts and that's haram, and you may even, you know, look at other people wearing shorts and that's haram, and uh, wasting time, and uh, you should be in the masjid. And, and you could, it's, you almost felt like I'm about to cringe right now because this is so, I feel embarrassed. Because even if you're right, this is the thing, even if you're right from one angle, is it the right thing to say to these kids? Like seriously, are they going to listen to a single thing you used to say? Or are they bored out of the residency? When is this person going to be quiet so I can go to the <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah? And Hakim, Hikmah, is about the execution of knowledge. The execution of knowledge. That's the difference between a wise man and a knowledgeable man. Yes? A wise person will know what to say, how to say it, and when to say it. And people, they appreciate that. And I think there is a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ that wisdom is the lost property of a believer. And it's a like Yes? That look, wisdom, write this down as a quote of the person, wisdom is the lost property of a believer. Think about that. The lost property of a believer. What does that mean? It means that you don't have to be a Muslim or a Muslim to be a wise man. It's possible. A person doesn't need to be a believer to have a share of wisdom. It's possible that you could meet a wise person. Yeah, some people call them psychiatrists, but you know, they're each of their own really. But wisdom is something is different than knowledge. And Allah is has the ultimate authority, respect and power, and also He is the all wise is God. Now look at the connection between the end of the verse and the beginning of the verse. What is the connection? In the beginning you're told that everything out there glorifies Allah. Says that He's perfect and flawless. And the ending of the verse selects two names. He is the most powerful and the most wise. Why did they end? Uh, or two other names. Why are these two names in particular? Think about that. Are they chosen without reason? Or are they chosen for a specific reason? What do you think? Specific reason, right? So what do you think? What's the connection between the beginning and the end of the verse? What do you think? Justification of the Making the, justifying the reason that yeah. very good, very good, uncle. Yes, there is an element of justification. You know, why do why does everything praise Allah and glorify Him? Is it misplaced? Is it misplaced praise, or is it justified? When you think about Allah being the most powerful authority, the most powerful, most powerful entity with the greater respect and the most authority, it then follows that he should be praised. Right? I mean, imagine for a moment that you woke up tomorrow and an entire country was given to you and put under your control. And you had power over an entire country. Maybe America. 
Imagine if all your friends found out about that. Oh my God, he's, he's in charge of America. What would happen to their sense of respect for you? Sure, I wouldn't. Oh my God. How powerful is he now? Yeah? They would begin to praise you, isn't it? There is a justification. Al Hakim, wisdom. When you see a person acting in a wise way, your heart warms to this person. Your appreciation, estimation of him increases. You want to praise him. So there is a connection. The ending of the verse is explaining to us why Allah deserves to be praised and to be glorified for all of creation. Okay, next verse. لَهُ مُرْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ يُحْيِي وَيُمِيتِ وَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ To him, control of the heavens and earth belong to him. He gives life and death. He has power over all things. Some of the scholars there say that this is a continuation of the first verse because you just heard that Allah is Aziz, the most powerful. Now you're going to hear further details that explain how he is so powerful, how he is the most authoritative. One of the reasons is because he controls whatever is in the sky and the earth, skies and the earth. And because he's the one who gives life and the one who takes life, and because he's over all things competent. The word mulk here, the whole mulk, is explained in a number of ways. I'll share with you two. First meaning of lahu mulk, that he has mulk over the skies and the earth, means he has control. He has control. He controls whatever takes place in the universe. Whichever corner of the universe, Allah has complete control over it. The second meaning, Ibn Kathir mentioned, is that he is the Malik, the owner or the master. The owner and the master of the skies and the earth. And there is a linguistic tool being used here to make the meaning more powerful. And that is the sequence of the wording. Literally speaking, the way you would translate this verse is control. No, sorry. Translation would be to him belongs the control of the skies and the earth. Instead of the control of the skies and the earth belongs to him. Now, which one is more powerful? To him belongs the control of the, of the skies and the earth, or the control of the skies and the earth belongs to him. First one or the second one? Huh? First one, isn't it? And this is because the Muta'alik al Khabr has been brought early, for those who know the Arabic terminology. And it produces a sense of exclusivity, as if to say, this is only true of Allah. Nobody else has control like this. Nobody else has ownership like this. And that's something you have to appreciate. I'll give you the example again about... Uh, you know what say? Huh? Shafi. Shafi. The Shafi, imagine tomorrow you wake up and you're given the control and ownership of the USA. Yes. It's all in your hands now. Yeah. Now, what do we say? Everyone who knows you, when they realize that, the appreciation, the estimation of you will increase, right? People will respect you more. People may fear you more as well. Isn't it? Oh, come on, if you control the USA and all the missiles that they have there, and seriously, people will be quaking in their boots, thinking, oh, if he doesn't like me, what could he do to me? Yeah? See, that is the type of feeling you should have when you read this verse. Allah, He has complete control of everything. Complete ownership also implies a relationship. If Allah is the owner, what does that make you? Hmm? If he's the owner, what does that make you? Like, I'm the owner of this iPad. What does this iPad become for me? My property. My property. The thing is, do we behave like we're Allah's property? Think about it. Do we behave like we're Allah's property? We read the whole book of Salah, but do we behave like Allah, you are my owner. Yeah? If you want to think of a master like a slave, if Allah is the master, then we are the slave. Do we behave like slaves? Another beautiful implication is that if Allah has complete control, then why is it that in times of difficulty, we do not turn to Him to help us? If we truly believed, 
Uh, even if we carry the example of uh, Shafir being in charge in the USA, if there was a mother in the USA who was in a very bad financial situation, maybe a single mother, and there was no one who could help her, who would she call upon if she could reach out to you? The guy right at the top right. Reach out to you. Maybe send you an email. Say, listen, I'm in a serious, difficult situation. Can you help me out? Because you're the guy in control, isn't it? So subhanAllah, if we really believe Allah is in control of our lives, that when we come across difficulty in life, we should believe that Allah is the one who will make the way out. Allah is the one who will bring relief. Allah is the one who will take care of our affairs. So knowing this should increase us in our tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It should increase us in our reliance and trust in Allah. It makes sense. If He's in control, then He is the one who will help me. And the control of Allah is irresistible. Meaning that if He wished something and somebody else didn't want something, who would win? Whose will would prevail? The will of Allah. No one else. Yes? Yuhi wa yubeets. Another fact about Allah that makes us appreciate His greatness is that He gives life and He takes it. Now imagine, you gave, you brought one person back to life. Imagine, you brought one person back to life. Tell me, the people who witnessed that, what did they think about you? They might think you're the Dajjal, but imagine if they think about the Dajjal. <laughs> They will start to venerate you. Maybe they call you a god, isn't it? And this fool, you bring someone back to life who they know is dead. Seriously, what would they think of you? They would think, man, this guy is something else. Maybe they will start to worship you. But we know this about Allah. Yuhi wa yubit, not to one man, to all creatures. Every single thing that exists has been brought into existence by Allah and Allah alone. And He is the one who will take away our lives as well. You know, think about if there was a person in this world who could switch off your heart at His will, would you ever want to make Him unhappy? Would you ever want to displease him? Would you ever want to say anything bad about him? Allah is the one who keeps us living and he will take us. That's powerful, man. And we should make us realize that Allah, not only is he so great, but we need Allah. We need to make Allah pleased. We need to make Allah pleased. And he is of all things competent. Some of the scholars, they say, this is like a summary of the verse. The summary of the verse, if you know all these things, is that Allah, over every single thing, Allah has complete control. And the word Qadir is the more intense spelling. This is Sirat al Mubalaba. The, the simple way of saying it is Allah is Qadir. I think in Urdu there's a word Qadir as well. Qadir. What does that mean in Urdu? Similar meaning. Similar meaning, yeah? Yes, power and control. Qadir is the more intense spelling to say he has complete control. Not some complete control, complete competency over every single thing. Yeah. Over every single thing. The third verse, this is the last verse for today. Who al awal wal akhir wal zahir wal batin wa huwa bi kulli shayin ali. This is the verse that Ibn Kathir said he believes that the Prophet was referring to it when he said that there is a verse in the Musabbihat, the seven chapters, which is more virtuous than a thousand verses. He said it is this verse. What does it mean? Simple translation. Allah, Huwa, He is the first, the last, one interpretation, the highest, the closest, and He is regarding everything knowledgeable. He is regarding everything knowledgeable. Now, this verse is speaking about who? People, prophets, nature, history, or Allah? Speaking about Allah. This is 
one of the reasons why this verse is more special. Because the verses that speak exclusively about Allah, they are more virtuous. Proof is, what is the greatest verse in the Quran? Ayatul Kursi. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul qayyum. What does Ayatul Kursi speak about? Prophets, history, nature, commandments, only about Allah. And what that should mean for us as students of the Quran is that the verse that we should look most forward to, to read, and be the most interested in, are not the verses that speak about scientific miracles. <laughs> not the verses that speak about seeming scientific miracles. They should be the verses that speak about Allah. Because they're the greatest verses in the sight of Allah. So they should become the greatest verses in our hearts as well. And this is one of those verses. What does it mean? Some of the scholars, they say, the Prophet ﷺ, he explained the meaning of this verse in a dua. The dua is in Sahih Muslim. He asked Allah that I ask you, and they begin to praise Allah. And he said, You are the first, and no one, فَلَيْسَ قَبْلَ كَشَيْءٍ So there is no one before you. There is nothing before you. وَأَنْتَ الْآخِرِ And you are the last, فَلَيْسَ بَعْنَ كَشَيْءٍ So there is nothing after you. وَأَنْتَ الظَّاهِرِ فَلَيْسَ فَوْقَ كَشَيْءٍ So there is nothing above you. وَأَنْتَ الْبَعْطِنِ فَلَيْسَ دُونَ كَشَيْءٍ And you are بَعْطِنِ So there is nothing that is closer than you. So how do we explain this? He explained an awal to mean that Allah is the first. What does that mean? Allah is the first. In simple English it means Allah is eternal and nothing else is eternal. If you go back, as far back as you go, nothing is eternal like Allah. Allah is eternal and nothing else is eternal. As far back as you go. Until akhir, if you go into the future, is anything eternal like Allah is eternal in the future? No. Only Allah is eternal in the future. Until awal wal akhir, eternity in both spectrums. A zahir has a number of meanings. I'm going to share with you just two. A zahir has, has a number of meanings. I'm going to share with you two. So the first thing of zahir is Allah is higher than anything else. Yeah. Number one, higher in terms of rank and honor. No one is more ranks higher than Allah. The second meaning is nothing is above us more than Allah. Yeah. Nothing is above Allah. Allah is the highest. The other meaning is that Allah is the most obvious entity in existence. The most obvious entity in existence. And I'm going to explain that in a minute. Al-Ba'atin, two meanings as well. First meaning, Allah is closer, is closer to things than anything else is. And there's a verse in Surah Al-Qaf, in Surah Al-Qaf, Allah says, وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيمِ We are closer to them than the jugular vein. The jugular vein, yeah. Allah is saying we are closer to them than even that. And that's the meaning of Ba'ati, first meaning. The second meaning is that Allah is the most hidden entity in existence. Okay. Now how do we explain the most obvious and the most hidden, the meanings of that? But what they mean by the most obvious in existence is that the proof of Allah's existence is more obvious than anything else. The fact that everything in existence points towards His existence, the presence of a maker, the creator. History points towards the existence of Allah. The revelation, the Quran, all of the reviewer books, Injil, Tawrat, Az-Zabur. Think about it, yeah? Think about it. The Quran, the Bible, the Old Testament, New Testament, uh, and other religious books. They are the most popular books in history, right? Isn't it? 
So you have these books that are the most popular books that ever existed in history, all saying that Allah exists. He deserves to be worshipped. Isn't it? And that's just one proof. Besides the proof in nature, the proof in history, the very fact that things exist is a proof of Allah. So what they mean by there is nothing that is more obvious in existence than Allah is that there's no thing that has more proof for existence than Allah. Make sense? Now al Baatin, the most hidden is the irony. How does that work? He's the most hidden and the most obvious. They said he's the most hidden in that though he is the most obvious in existence, no one can see Allah, nor can any imagination encompass his existence. Yeah? But you can't see Allah in this world. Nor can you imagine what Allah looks like. So in that way, he's the most hidden as well. Yeah? Now if you add all of these things together, you see that in isolation, <laughs> each name, the first, the last, the highest or the most obvious, the closest, and the thing which is most hidden, is amazing independently. But when you put them all together, they become even more amazing. Yeah, and as the Mahri, he said, if you look at the verse, there is a wow between each name. Huwa al awwalu wa al akhir wa al dahir wa al batin and and and. He is the first and the last and the highest and the closest. Now he said that if you look at another place in the Quran, for example, in Surah Al Hashr, Allah Subhanahu says. الملك القدوس السلام مؤمن مهيمن عزيز جبار متكبر. Eight names are brought. Is there a wow in between? There's no wow. Why? Over there is eight. There's no wow. Over here there's four. There's wow. And why? He suggests because in Surah Al Hashr all the names are complementary. Allah is al Malik al Qudus. He is the King and the Pure. Al Mu'min, the trustworthy. Al Muhaymin, some said the safeguard. Yeah. Al Aziz, Al Jabbar, the mighty, the compeller. They're all very similar, different nuances. But if you look at Surah Al Hadith, they contrast starkly. Al Awwal and Akhir, the first and the last. Now, how is that even possible? Like, you could be the first human being to walk the face of the earth, but you're not going to be the last one. It's impossible. You can't be the first and the last. The highest. Okay, you're the highest person in the world. But can you also be the closest as well to everything? You can't. To be the first and the last and the highest and the closest all together at the same time? Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Seriously, it blows your mind if you think about it. Yes? And he said that the and in between, it is, its function is to show the contrast between the lips. This will help. And the last part of this, wa huwa bi kulli shayin ali. And he is regarding all things alim. The word alim means the most knowledgeable. But the simple way of spelling this is alim. You know what they say, he's an alim. It means he's a knowledgeable person. Alim is sirat al the more intense spelling. You said alim doesn't just mean knowledgeable, it means supremely knowledgeable. There's another intensified spelling which is alam. Alam. Which also means incredibly knowledgeable as well. Well, who be kulli shayin alim? Therefore, the way you translate it is that Allah, with regards to every single thing, has supreme knowledge. Some of the scholars they say that it's almost like a summary of all these names, because Allah is the first; He does everything that happens after us, and because He's the last, nothing will escape Him, and because He's the highest, nothing can escape Him, and because He's closest to everything, nothing can escape His knowledge. وَهُوَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ Therefore, the conclusion of the ayahs. It's quite amazing, isn't it? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the statement of Al-Biqai, Al-Biqai, he, he, he's a 9th century scholar. He wrote a book in Tafsir, Dur, Nadhmu uh, Durar. Nadhmu Durar is a Tafsir book which looks at the Munasabat, the connection between verses. Yeah? And even inside the verse, the connection between the beginning and the end. He has a statement that whoever reflects over the beginning of the verse, he will appreciate the ending of the verse. And whoever reflects over the ending of the verse, he will get the beginning of the verse. Very interesting, yeah? He's, he's basically speaking about a technique. That if you think deeply about the beginning of the verse, 
you will be able to appreciate the ending. And if you think about the ending, you get the beginning. And this is a very good example. For who are we saying Alim? It is a summary of the verse. Yes, it is a summary of the verse. I want you to appreciate something. What does it mean to us when we hear Allah is the most knowledgeable? Yeah. Now, give you a scenario. Okay. Imagine, actually I'll give you that example. Your friend, your colleague, the scientist, he says there's this guy. He's in astrophysics. He's an expert. He's so well read. His papers are lauded by everyone in the field as being the most sophisticated papers in the subject. Now, imagine you are in the presence of this professor. Professor in astrophysics. Tell me, would you dare speak about astrophysics in his presence? What do you think? You just, you know, I know that's what you think, but you know, I actually think it's, it's not as I think as black holes. I don't think I exist. Now, would you start to just talk about your opinions about things? In the presence of this professor, would you? Would any same person do that? No. Think about this now. Allah and Ali. When it comes to the teachings of Islam, how many people like to air their opinions? I know Allah says this about hijab. Me, you know, I kind of think it's like this. You know, yeah, it's true Sharia says that you should punish people like this, but I kind of think that that's a bit backward. Like, you know, and I don't even think that's, you know, that's the right thing to do. I think in the context that we live in, it should be like this. Do you see what I'm saying here? How, how foolish could you be? You are speaking to the one who is Alim. He has expert knowledge of your own nature and the world that you live in. In fact, he created it all. How could you even think about suggesting something different to what he says? Does it make sense? It doesn't make sense. Now, if you couple this with the Hakim, the most wise, you think to yourself, if Allah is the most wise in what he says and what he does and the religion which he gives us, it must mean that every teaching of Islam has wisdom in it. Perhaps wisdom that I can't see. Now, imagine you're back in the professor's presence, okay? So now he's talking, he's giving a lecture. Uh, maybe about black holes. That is what they call it, isn't it? Even I'm unsure right now. If somebody out there knows more than me, I don't want to sound like a fool. Black hole says, he says, now he says, according to latest scientific findings and experiments, black holes don't actually exist. And you always thought they exist. Now tell me, what would you think now? How would you feel? Would you not reassess what you what you held to be true? and change it in line with his opinion. You would, wouldn't you? You would say, man, if he says there's no such thing as black color, then that's the, that's the way it goes, man. I must have been wrong my whole life. In fact, everyone must have been wrong, because he knows more than everyone. Am I right or wrong? Now, when Allah says something, and you think, really, is it? SubhanAllah. How could that be the case? That you could think you know better than Allah? In fact, you should tell yourself, yeah, you know, I was wrong. And Allah knows better. Allah says, doesn't the one who created know better? Like seriously, human beings, humble yourselves, man. Humble yourselves. Allah, what He knows, you couldn't even begin to imagine. The way Allah cares about you and your future, your mother doesn't care about you that much. Allah it's true, your mother does not care about you as much as Allah cares about you. How could we as Muslims ever doubt the teaching of Islam? How could we ever criticize an element of the beautiful deen of Allah? How? See, the problem is in the heart. The heart has become hard. The heart has become corrupted and tainted by other ideologies and propaganda and bakwas, as they say. Yeah. And because of all of that corruption, your estimation of Allah has diminished. And because of that, you start to question what Allah says. So if you appreciated the greatness of Allah, how amazing He is, how supreme He is, all of those questions will become answered and maybe even vanish. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us in our estimation of His greatness. Allahumma ameen. May Allah make us of those that remember Him in the morning and in the evening. And may Allah make us of those who have humility. Allahumma ameen. Allah wa sallam wa sallam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslima.